Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Fostering a Scientifically Informed Populace, with guest speakers, Drs. Gail Sinatra and Barbara Hofer. My name is Michael Todd, and I'm the Social Science Communication Manager at Sage Publications. Let me begin by introducing you to our speakers today. Dr. Gail Sinatra is Associate Dean for Research and Professor of Education and Psychology at the Rossier School of Education at the University of Southern California. She's the past editor of the journal Educational Psychologist and former vice president of AERA's Division C, Learning and Instruction. She is a fellow of the American Psychological Association, American Educational Research Association, and the Society for Text and Discourse. She heads the Motivated Change Research Lab, which aims to understand the cognitive, motivational, and emotional processes that lead to attitude change, conceptual change, and successful STEM learning. Dr. Barbara Hofer is Professor of Psychology at Middlebury College in the areas of Developmental, Educational, and Cultural Psychology, and is a Fellow of the American Psychological Association also. She received um, national awards for both teaching and research, receiving the Review of Research Award from the American Educational Research Association with Paul Pintrick, and the McKeechee Early Career Teaching Award from the American Psychological Association. In addition to publishing several dozen articles and book chapters, she co-edited the book, Personal Epistemology, the Psychology of Beliefs about Knowledge and Knowing. This one-hour webinar will be recorded and archived for, pers uh, for future viewing. We will be sending out a link to view it and access the slides to all registrants in the coming weeks. If any of you have any problems with audio or viewing mode during the webinar, please use the Q&A box at the right of your screen, and one of our helpful team members will get back to you ASAP. At the end of the prepared session, prepared portion of the webinar, we'll have some time for Q&A from attendees, so please also use the Q&A box to ask any questions to our speakers throughout the webinar. Please also take note of the webinar hashtag, hashtag Sage Talks, and feel free to ask questions or leave comments there. And without further ado, I'll pass it over to Barbara. Hello. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Gail and I look forward to telling you more about what we've learned about problems in the public understanding of science, why that matters, and what we can do about it. In the short time we have, we're going to highlight some of the central issues, basically as a preview of the more comprehensive list that we have been developing as we've been working together. First, why does this matter? Um, do we have slides? Yes. Next slide. Thank you. First, why does this matter? Well, a democracy depends on an educated citizenry that has the critical thinking skills to evaluate information about a range of scientific issues. And these are issues that can affect their own health, the lives of others, their communities, the nation, and the planet. And some of the issues that have drawn attention in this regard are things like the human causes of climate change, the safety of GMOs, should I eat them or not, concerns about the consequences of fracking, is it something I should protest, be worried about, or not think about, or whether to vaccinate one's children, how do I decide if that's something that I should do, is it good for my kids, is it good for others, what are the issues involved. And as the issue of vaccinations indicates, sometimes health decisions that individuals make have much broader community consequences, as was evident in the Disney outbreak. And with the climate change, this influences the kind of actions we agree to take for the health of the planet. But individuals are often poorly equipped to evaluate scientific claims that they hear or that they read online. They may lack a fundamental understanding of the premises of science, which we're going to discuss later. And there's also an interesting disconnect between what individuals believe about particular scientific issues and what scientists think they know, as the next slide indicates. So the Pew Research Center, which does a lot of studies in this regard, did a study on science and society in 2015, and they decided to survey both the lay public and scientists who were members of the American Academy for the Advancement of Science to look at the discrepancies that they suspected existed. And they did a couple dozen issues, and I'm just showing three here, but one of them for example, is, is it safe to eat GMOs? And there's a 51% discrepancy between what the public thinks and what scientists think. 
think. And as we know from many studies on climate change, there's also a wide gap there. But even on something about whether increasing population is a major problem shows that the public is far less concerned that this is an issue than scientists are. So you might think that we just need to teach more and better science. And we do. We do need improved science education, and this is something Gail and I are very concerned about and have also worked on. But increasingly, as psychologists, we've learned that knowledge is not enough. Many topics are complex and really difficult to understand, and knowledge is changing rapidly. The kind of scientific issues that require adult evaluation of evidence are not the topics that were taught in school. So the kind of knowledge we need about science transcends content. So we know that scientific literacy is more than knowing science content. It also involves an understanding of the nature of science and how it's produced and validated and the limitations of science. And sometimes we think that what happens is that in terms of how science is conducted, um, we often overschool individuals in a narrow view of the scientific method. And yet many areas of science use methods other than experimental lab studies. So some individuals may be dismissive of claims that draw more on inference from accumulated evidence. And that's how we reach conclusions about things like evolution, climate change, planetary motion, geological ages, et cetera. So along these lines, the American Academy for the Advancement of Science has tried to identify and assert what is it that scientists do believe about how science is conducted. And these are the things we should probably be making clear to our students. One is that the world is understandable through systematic study, and there are methods for doing this, but vast methods, as I pointed out. And science cannot provide complete answers to all questions. Much of scientific knowledge is highly durable, and yet scientific ideas are subject to change. But what we found is that these ideas are often misunderstood, and in particular in some of the research I've done, we found that individuals are uncertain about this idea of tentativeness. They think that means that scientists basically just don't know. They get confused, and there's some interesting research on whether they um, how they go about thinking about whether they think scientists are lacking confidence in what they know, whether the jury's still out on issues like evolution. I mean, this is really problematic when we say that it's tentative. So we have to make it clearer what that might mean. One of the constructs that has most interested me and that I've done a lot of research on in this regard is epistemic cognition, which is simply a term for how individuals think and reason about knowledge and knowing. What do they believe knowledge is? And how does that affect how they go about knowing? And it turns out to be particularly important in weighing competing truth claims and deciding which authorities to trust, which is a fundamental issue in the public understanding of science. Mm -hmm. And a number of psychologists have proposed that there's a developmental trajectory of epistemic cognition, that we move along a particular trajectory in our lives, and that the first of these is absolutism. And that is typically what individuals, um, when individuals think that knowledge is objective, it's certain, it's finite, it's handed down from authority. Information is either right or wrong. And then eventually that progresses to a more subjective stance, what we call multiplism, where individuals base what they know on interpretation and opinion. And there are no clear criteria for evaluating a truth claim. And then the final stage is what we think of as evaluativism where we reconcile the objective and the subjective aspects of knowing, and we have a sense of this relative nature of uncertainty. Knowledge is contextual. We have the ability to evaluate authority and knowledge claims. And I think educators in the audience are likely to recognize this as an important and reasonable goal, and yet this stage is all too rare among U.S. adults, which is really quite troubling. So let's look at how this plays out in science understanding in the next slide. Very simply here, absolutists, for example, might interpret the fact that 97% of climate scientists agree about the causes, but that thinks, they may think that means, oh, we don't have consensus, so the knowledge is uncertain, we don't really know. Or multiplist, they think that all knowledge is tentative and relative, so scientific claims are often just viewed as the opinions of a particular scientist likely to be contradicted by another. I've done a lot of interviews with adolescents at this stage who are just puzzled about whether we could ever know anything for certain. They just imagine that it's all up for grabs to a certain degree. We have to think about how we communicate with individuals about relative uncertainty and about the progression of knowledge. And then evaluativism, you'll recognize in this next slide, 
this description that I gave earlier, that we have this sense of the relative nature of certainty, criteria for evaluating knowledge, claims, and sources of authority, and how to use evidence. And so this is the goal that I think many of us as educators are striving towards, and it's obviously what we need in an educated public to be able to enhance science understanding and to evaluate the kind of complex knowledge that are before us. Another issue that we have found to be important is how science gets communicated. And science communicators may inadvertently uh, play to public confusion about both the changing nature of science and the issue of tentativeness. Often they strive for what they think of as balanced reporting or both sides of an issue when there really aren't two sides. So for example, in the issue of evolution, there was a, which Gail and I have both studied quite a bit, what is it people believe about evolution? There were a lot of reporters who thought, well, we have to make sure that we present the idea of creationism, even though that is not, there is no scientific evidence for that. So the human causes of climate change. I mean, I think reporters love controversy, and we have no shortage of them. We just don't need to manufacture them or to give undue attention to denialist, for example. And exploiting that uncertainty in science can actually lead to manufactured doubt. We're creating doubt in the minds of some people about issues that are fairly reasonably well resolved. Another issue of concern for us when we think about epistemic cognition is also the idea of epistemic trust. And we know now that there's abundant information available online to us. I can't imagine if I had medical issues or a family member did that I wouldn't rush to the internet to try to figure out what I could learn. And yet, I know that I have to be particularly careful about what I read, and it's difficult to assess validity, accuracy, bias. Uh, one of the things that philosopher Michael Lynch talks about is that we now have Google knowing rather than depth of understanding. Sometimes we read things very shallowly and move on to make a decision without going more deeply. We know we also have savvy organizations that have figured out how to present particular points of view, and it can be hard for individuals to know what to trust. For example, if you were to Google, did dinosaurs coexist with humans, a topic that might interest any school child, you would find a number of the top answers answering in the affirmative. Um, and then you might want to look and see, well, who supports that particular point of view? But would a school child know that the Institution for Creation Research a name with research in the title, might have a particular point of view to put forward. So how do we prepare individuals for this very information-rich and sometimes misleading environment? We also know that choosing who and what to trust can be influenced by social identity. We're not going to go into that here in depth, but many have pointed out how we are influenced by those who think like us, and we may take shortcuts in our own understanding to simply side with those who are like us. We also have issues of scientific trust eroded. So you can think about the issue of peer review failure and when that happens. So the example of the British medical journal, The Lancet, when they posted the article about vaccinations being linked to autism and then later retracted it, many people are not even aware that that article was retracted or that that was the foundation for erroneous beliefs. Or there might be a distortion of data to promote pharmaceutical sales. Opioids were supposedly unlikely to be addictive. And we know how that turned out now that we have more deaths from opioid overdose than we do from traffic accidents and, and crime going up dramatically as a result. So um, another big issue on epistemic trust for me is thinking about epistemic vigilance and critical thinking. And you know what does that mean when we think about epistemic vigilance? What are we talking about? Well, I think we want to be hypersensitive to the kinds of things that are being presented to us, that we're aware that we need to be vigilant about the sources of information. And a heightened awareness of this need to evaluate claims, but also the critical thinking skills to do so. And we need to train people in the evaluation of scientific expertise and claims. We've also read extensively that epistemic trust can be problematic in marginalized communities. If you think about the Tuskegee study that went on for decades, to, to study men who had syphilis and who were untreated in an Alabama community and the ripple effect that had for people distrusting doctors, scientists, researchers, etc. And so the scientific community needs to gain the trust of the lay public. And I'll just end with two recent stories that were in the news this week rather prominently that I think illustrate why this matters. But one is, again, the um, LA Times investigation into the opioid crisis.
and how many people were misled, including doctors and their patients, and how concerns got downplayed, diminished, and dismissed by the pharmaceutical industry. The second is the revelation that the sugar industry was a funding source in early studies of whether sugar or fat were the central culprit in heart disease. And this was at a time when the New England Journal of Medicine did not disclose funding sources. Some have speculated that the current obesity crisis can be linked back to that. So again, I'll just conclude where I begin in saying that these things matter. They have long-term repercussions in many cases, and we need to really work towards educating the public to be better consumers of science and to understand it more diligently. And I'll hand it over to Gail. Thank you, Barbara. I can get the slides to advance again now. There we go. Uh, thank you very much, Barbara. I'm going to shift gears now to changing conceptions about science and scientific knowledge. So we know that individuals have a number of misconceptions about scientific topics. Misconceptions about things like genetically modified foods. Some people think all genetic modifications create harmful foods. Some people think that climate change is caused by natural fluctuations in temperature patterns alone, and they don't recognize the influence of humans. And we know that if we teach more about these topics in this content, that that's helpful for overcoming these scientific misconceptions. But Barbara and I also think that something else is necessary, and that's epistemic conceptual change. That we think it's important for people to not only change their understanding of content, but change their understanding of the nature of knowledge and knowing. So just as Barbara was talking about, changing how you think about knowledge itself, who to trust, how to weigh evidence, is just as important as understanding the science. And we want to give you an illustration of that with just one study. And um, Barbara and I both have a number of relevant studies to this topic, but I want to share this particular one uh, that was done by my colleagues and I, Doug Lombardi from Temple University and Michael Nussbaum from UNLV. And in this particular study, we were looking at reappraising plausibility judgments. So plausibility judgments are important for something like climate change because not everyone thinks that climate change is plausible. And so we thought it would be important to see if you could use critical evaluation to promote a better quality of plausibility judgment. And what that entails is coordination of theory and evidence in a conscious and controlled manner. That's something that we refer to as high metacognitive engagement. So what does all that mean? Well, I can explain that through the study itself. The participants in this study were middle school students in earth sciences. It was a diverse sample of students, and we had seven classes that engaged in critical evaluation. That was our treatment group. And we had seven classes that were engaged in their regular earth sciences curriculum about the same topics. And both classes were taught by their regular teachers. In the study design, we had some pre-instruction instruments we administered regarding their knowledge and their plausibility judgments, for example. And then we had two groups, as I said, the comparison group was really engaged in just their regular curriculum, answering questions about climate change evidence and making predictions, the typical standard curriculum. The treatment group engaged in something different, which we call the Climate Change Model Evidence Link, or MEL, diagram. It's an explanatory task and an instructional activity. And then we administered some post-instruction instruments. So what's the MEL? The model evidence link or MEL diagram is presented to students and they are asked to evaluate four pieces of evidence against two models. So you see here the four pieces of evidence and the two models in this case were model A the scientific model of human-induced climate change, and Model B, which was a prominent skeptic model, which was increased solar radiation. And if you look at these arrows, what you see is students are asked to evaluate 
each piece of evidence against each model. So for example, they look at evidence one and they decide, does it support, strongly support, contradict, or have nothing to do with model A? And they do that for model B. And then they go through each of the four pieces of evidence the same way. We then assess their perceptions of model plausibility and correctness using these two different instruments. So did they change in their view of which model was more plausible, and which model they felt was more scientifically accurate? And we found that they did. Those students who engaged in the MEL activity changed both their perceptions of model plausibility and correctness towards the scientific model of human-induced climate change. And you can see in these pre-post um, comparisons that it was a significant change, but also this change held up. When we went back and talked to students six months later, we still noticed this advantage for the treatment group. In addition, they changed their knowledge of climate change. So those students in the treatment group were more likely to say that they thought humans played a significant role. And they also were more likely to dismiss the skeptic causes that we had um, presented in Model B, such as increased solar radiation. So what you see is knowledge can be shifted and epistemic views of knowledge can be shifted, but that's just knowledge. And what we know is that knowledge is linked to two other important constructs attitudes and emotions. Negative attitudes and negative emotions are generally what's linked to misconceptions. And we feel like you have to change all three when you're talking about science. We call this the hat trick of change. You have to change three things and it's not easy to do. So I'm going to break that down a little bit by talking about the relationship between just two of those three, because it's real difficult to talk about all three at once, I'm going to talk about the relationship between conceptual knowledge and attitudes. So looking at conceptual knowledge, you can have an accurate scientific conception or a misconception, as we've discussed, about a scientific topic. And then your attitude can be either favorable or unfavorable, pro or con. And this leads to four profiles. I'm going to go through each of the profiles in turn. So profile A is a person who has an accurate conception. So they think that humans are causing climate change, and they have a positive or pro attitude. For example, they may be in favor of climate change initiatives that mitigate the effects of climate change. Profile B is a person who has um, an accurate conception, they think that humans are causing climate change, but they're con in their attitude or negative in their attitude against climate change initiatives. With these people, it's not that they misunderstand the science, it's just perhaps that they feel that mitigation strategies might be ineffectual or perhaps too costly. Profile C is an individual who has a misconception. For example, some people think all forms of pollution are the cause of climate change, when in fact it's really increased CO2 that's the major factor. So what's the problem with that? Well, these people are pro in their attitudes perhaps, and so they're in favor of climate change initiatives, but if you don't understand the science, you might not be in favor of the right or most effective mitigation strategy policies. The last profile, profile D, are individuals who think that climate change is not human caused, and they're also against climate change initiatives. And we think that these individuals can really be shifted in their attitudes by first correcting their misconceptions. And now I want to bring back in emotions. So remember I said emotions play an important role. We have found in other studies that emotions can mediate the role of misconceptions and attitudes. In other words, it's important to tamp down negative emotions through helping people to understand the science and the nature of science. And we find that this leads to more positive attitudes and helps us move towards that hat trick of change. <laughs>
I want to move now towards another topic that Barbara and I have discussed in this and other papers. For example, in a 2014 Educational Psychologist article, when we talked about the motivations that are important to consider because they influence people's reasoning. There are many, but in this work we just talked about four, social identity, cognitive biases, vested interests, and epistemic motives. So I want to talk about each one of these briefly in turn. Social identity is very powerful. We identify with a particular social group, and that means we want to share their beliefs to be a part of the group and to remain a part of the group. So here's an individual who may think, I'm a conservative, and conservatives reject climate change. Maybe I should reject climate change, too, to remain a part of my social group and to maintain my social identity as a conservative. Vested interest is that you may have some sort of interest in the outcome of the science, perhaps an economic interest. In fact, we see that countries with higher GDPs tend to have lower climate change acceptance rates. Perhaps there's more at stake for them. Cognitive biases are things like availability heuristics. So when there's a big snowstorm at an unusual time of the year, snowmageddon, everything stops, then individuals stop and think, wow, you know, just remember the snowstorm, it just happened, climate change must be over. And then there's epistemic motives. So back to these ideas about knowledge, this is motives about knowledge. Maybe you have a need for closure or a discomfort with ambiguity. So that's a problem for understanding climate models. Climate models will never be completely resolved or completely unambiguous because, in fact, they're models. And so you have to be able to withstand a little bit of uncertainty to accept those models. All right, so we want to wrap up our presentation today with two sets of implications. We want to start with implications for educators. So we really think, and it should be obvious from our presentation, that we need to teach scientific processes to develop epistemic competence. In other words, how is it that you evaluate knowledge? What's a good way to do that? Whom should you trust about GMOs? Whom should you trust about vaccinations? How do you evaluate that? We also think you need to te teach for deeper understanding. So we have a tendency in K-12 through and higher education to try to cover a lot of topics, and when we do that, we don't have time for the levels of deep understanding that might be necessary for complex topics like climate change. We need to promote epistemic cognition, which is thinking and reasoning about knowledge. That's a theme throughout our work, because we really believe the more you understand about how scientists come to know, then you understand a little bit more about why they hold certain perspectives to be more scientifically accurate than others. And we feel like you can use instructional scaffolds to support that in students. So I shared that mal activity with you, but there are many excellent instructional scaffolds out there developed by a variety of researchers that can help individuals to weigh evidence and think deeply. We closed our paper and we'll close our presentation today with implications for policy we're really advocating a return to funding research on thinking, educational research on thinking. I think we fund a lot of research today on developing scientific learning environments, scientific interventions for learning in K-12 and higher ed. And those are great, and we support that wholeheartedly. But we think the balance has shifted towards developing instructional materials and interventions and away from fully investigating further, what, how to develop these critical thinking skills that we've been discussing, awareness of epistemic cognition and how to use it. And I think it's a critical time, and we both do, to support more of that kind of research. We also support standards that emphasize how to think over what to think. And we think that the next generation science standards and common core are efforts in that direction where really both emphasize process, not just content. 
who support the development of more malleable psychological skills and dispositions. So some of us are more reticent to accept new information than others, but we know that some of these skills can be developed. It takes time and it involves changing our practices in K-12 and higher education. But we can create students who are more critical thinkers and more open to alternative points of view if it's a deep-seated part of their experiences in the curriculum. And as Barbara mentioned, we need to push back on this current trend of ignoring the factual basis of claims. So in science reporting and in online media, we definitely see a lot of claims about chocolate is good for you or chocolate will, chocolate will kill you. And um, these claims really we need to push back and say, how many studies were done on this and how many participants were in these studies? You really need to think carefully before we jump on scientific bandwagons without understanding the actual factual basis of the claims that are being made. And of course, we would really appreciate more rigorous teacher preparation and teacher preparation standards. And teachers should know not only more science, but more about the nature of science. And that's it. Thank you so very much, Dr. Sinatra and Alfred, for your informative presentation. We're going to spend some time addressing some of the questions from the audience. Uh, and to the audience, please continue to send those questions in using the question box on the right side of your screen or on Twitter using the hashtag SageTalks. If we can't get to your question by the end of the hour, um, I'm hoping our speakers may address some of them in a follow-up blog post um, on the Sage blog, Sage Connection. Also, if you'd like to learn more about the issues raised, please read Dr. Sinatra and Hofer's article, Public Understanding of Science, Policy and Educational Implications in the Journal Policy Insights from the Behavioral and Brain Sciences. Now for the, the, the first question, and it kind of follows from what Gail was talking about with motivations, and, and we're wondering, what do you think the current U.S. presidential election tells us about public understanding of science today? You don't have to name names. But just in general, what, what do we think this is telling us? Well, I think it illustrates a number of the points that Barbara and I were discussing. People are making claims about whether climate change is real or climate change is a hoax, you know, who maybe aren't as uh, informed about the science as they need to be. And so when we make those claims, you know, are, though, are we trusting those people as opposed to actually going to investigate and look at what the science is. And that's difficult to do um, because it's a complex field. And so I do think we, we have an illustration of all the points we're talking about, about epistemic trust and about investigating evidence. If we just accept um, statements about science made by politicians who may or may not be informed on the issues. I also weigh in. Can I make a comment? Yes. Oh, please do. I, I was just going to say, Gail and I have talked about what unusual times these are that we would have a presidential candidate who in her campaign speech in the summer had to say, I believe in science. The part of her <laughs> speech that was so widely tweeted and repeated and talked about. And it, we're in unusual times. It's hard to imagine how many years back it would have been that that we would have seen science as something you needed to claim a belief in. It's really not a belief system. It's not a religion. It's not <laughs> it doesn't exist on that plane. And yet that you have to staunchly defend that you accept this. And so we also need to understand how did we become a nation that is somewhat anti-intellectual, distrusting of science, suspicious about some of these claims. These are much larger issues that we need to address as a nation and in our schools in terms of understanding the nature of science, the role of science, how we use it to make the kind of claims we do, and um, you know, how did we get to the point where we can dismiss an entire body of evidence. That's even more troubling than study by study. Thank you. So we have a couple questions coming in on educational scaffolding, but before we go to those, I just want to deal with one more issue in, in somewhat in, in related to the current uh, terrain in the United States, and that was when Barbara was talking about people who cast doubt on things professionally. And I'm just wondering how pernicious is that uh, to have people who either from a, a, a vested commercial interest or perhaps even a cultural or religious interest have in pushing something that is ascientific. 
We lost Barbara there for a moment. I hope she comes back. Um, so I'll start answering until she comes back. Are you there, Barbara? Um, so anyway, I'll start in, until Barbara works out her, her webcam issues. So um, absolutely, it's a challenge when the scientific community has a great consensus on a topic, like climate scientists, 98% of climate scientists agree that humans are a contributing factor in global warming. But often when it's portrayed in the media, you'll have two people on, one who is presenting a scientific point of view and the other who's presenting a skeptic point of view, and that really portrays the issue as balanced. Like it's 50-50, it's a jump ball, we really don't know. So we're really advocating people are more accurate in presenting uh, the mainstream scientific point of view and not presenting just a balanced point when in fact it isn't balanced. Barbara, I think you're back if you want to contribute to that answer. Sorry, I, I would just echo what you've said, and I think there are communication scientists, people working in the field of communication studies who are writing about some of this quite persuasively of looking at issues of manufactured doubt, issues of presenting balance in ways that actually get interpreted as bias. I mean, how it is that we need to help the press decide not to foment controversy but to figure out where real controversy exists and cover that but not invent it. And I think I, I don't have all the details on this, but I know a few years ago the BBC decided that they really didn't want their reporters treating climate change as a controversial issue anymore, and obviously they got backlash for that as well. Where can we, let's uh, change the uh, tack for just a moment. Where can we find some specific examples of instructional scaffolds so we can see exactly what you mean and, and get some useful ideas for classes? There are so many great resources available for educators. Um, there are websites for science teachers. Um, I'll just give one example, and that would be um, Understanding Evolution. This is an excellent resource developed by Berkeley that has background on evolution, and it has uh, instructional activities in there. Now there's also one on understanding climate change. Um, there's another one called How Global Warming Works, developed by another Berkeley professor um, and colleague and friend of ours, Dr. Michael Rainey, that gives very brief explanations of how global warming works. His videos that are 30 seconds long, that's an instructional scaffold that can be shared um, with students because understanding the mechanism helps overcome those misconceptions I mentioned that are so important. So um, you can go to national science teacher organizations and their websites. They have a plethora of information available for supports for teachers. And another question related to access. We have someone from a developing country a lot of things we've talked about have been kind of U.S. or, or um, um, developed world uh, focused, but it's just like the, one of the concerns they have is that access to scientific knowledge and research, especially for people on the street, are, is a, probably a, a bigger issue than people that are actively trying to be ascientific. I'm wondering if you can talk about that for a moment. Barbara, do you want to take that one? I, I would say go ahead. Do you want to? Well, I would say that what we are seeing is that um, developing countries are very excited and interested in increasing access to science and engaging more individuals in science. It seems that sometimes in the United States we seem to be interested in going the other way. <laughs> but here, um, what individuals from developing countries can do, depending on their access to the Internet, is that they can um, access the resources that I that I just mentioned, uh, more and more individuals in developing countries have smartphones and have access to information on the internet. So the days of having to buy an expensive textbook, um, I think, are, are shifting away and we're moving towards people being able to hold in their hand knowledge sources 
of information through uh, their handheld devices. However, that entails all of the problems that Barbara and I talked about, about just Googling information and not knowing who to trust. And so at the same time that they have access to this information in ways they never did before, uh, they, they're going to need help, as all students do, in understanding how to sift through that information and get to the more scientific facts. A question we got from um, um, our Twitter feed, uh, again, and it's uh, hashtag Sage Talks for those who want to communicate with us that way, is given the uh, disconfirmation biases and self and emotional investment and anti-scientific views, how can these views be changed? Well, I think, go ahead, Barbara. I mean, I think that's one of the largest issues we face now, and I think there are uh, lots of things that we need to pursue further on what kind of work is persuasive, looking at social persuasion literature, trying to understand, again, Gail's issues on conceptual change, how do we bring people around. And we know that we're in a very polarized environment right now, a really problematic one, and trying to understand what is effective. And I think it's also why we get very caught up in caring about the K-12 world. How is it that we inculcate some habits of mind early on with individuals that would allow us to raise a community of educated citizenry who is much more aware of this early on and less influenced by those kinds of biases that we've discussed. Gail, do you want to jump in? No, I absolutely agree. The one thing I would add is we're finding more and more in our research about the importance of decreasing negative emotions. People are very passionate and negative sometimes about scientific issues that they may not fully understand or may misunderstand. And in our research, we have found that for giving them more information about how scientists came to their understandings. You know, a good example is a study a colleague, um, Susan Broughton and I did, looking at how upset fifth graders were about the demotion of Pluto to dwarf planetary status. Um, they were pretty angry. Um, but when we were able to explain the science and the scientific rationale for why that um, demotion was made, um, their negative emotions tamped down. And we're finding in our other work that once those negative emotions are tamped down a little bit, then people are more receptive to the science and end up shifting their attitudes towards more positive views. And you know, I'll add in there again another example along these lines is that Individuals, again, need to understand something about the nature of science and what kind of claims to trust. And so a, a, a friend of mine who did not vaccinate her children, and her, her daughter was 10 at the point that she wrote an article about changing her mind and decided to vaccinate, she was persuaded by the fact that she had read something, she'd been looking on Facebook at um, a, a good friend of hers who is a scientist and who was posting information about climate change and then posted some things about vaccinations and she realized she was totally persuaded by the climate change literature. This was scientifically based and so she began to think, well I do believe in science, I do trust science, I need to do the scientific reason, reading on this topic and understand not just the fact that I live among a community of friends who have these sort of beliefs that you know, we're cautious and skeptical of all of this. And she wrote a very persuasive piece in the local paper about how she came around to uh, vaccinate her child and why other people should do so and why we need to have some trust and faith in the scientific enterprise, that that's what had weighed her over. It's what Gail calls epistemic conceptual change. It's a classic example of that. She understood more about science, therefore she generalized it out. If I, if I accept what they're saying about climate change, I really need to understand the vaccination literature too. I'm wondering, um, uh, I appreciate the Pluto example, and I'm wondering if you have any uh, examples that are not environmental or not uh, consumer focused, like cigarette sugar vaccination. Uh, for example, the questioner is wondering, do you have anything from engineering? Yes, yes we do. Um, I'm engaged in a large scale project called Speedometry with fourth grade students, and um, nothing controversial about the topic there. Um, this project is funded by Mattel Children's Foundation, and we bring Hot Wheels cars and tracks into the classroom for students to get engaged in scientific topics like physics, force, and force in motion, for example. And what we see there is some of these same things playing out. For example, 
we noticed that girls' negative attitudes and emotions towards science decreased when they engaged in our speedometry curriculum um, because it was um, fun and, and enjoyable and it decreased some of that negativity and that opens up their reception then to the scientific knowledge. So it doesn't have to be just about a controversial topic, it can be just your basic um, understanding of science and whether you're interested in science or not. And I'll go back to the Pluto example because Gail and I were delighted to discover 10 years ago that we were both doing research on the same topic and we were bringing kids into my lab and asking them how they felt about Pluto being diminished in stature, no longer a planet. And there was this heated emotion over how can that be? This is something I learned and it's, again, knowledge is certain and finite and it can't be changed. But then we asked them, well, how do scientists make this decision? We were curious if they had a sense of how this came about and how is it that scientists can come to such conclusions? And it was implausible to them that the scientists could have acted in the way that they acted or on the kind of information they acted on. And when we said, well, if they're, what would they need to know in order to make this decision? And a good number of the younger kids, sixth graders, said that they would need to go to Pluto to find out if it was a planet. <laughs> you know, they had this highly objective, this experiential notion of how science is done. And again, it's a problem of how we teach the scientific method rather than understanding how it is that scientists draw inferences, reach consensus, come to judgments together. And that is simply missing in a lot of science education, back to the, the teaching the nature of science. Do you have any thoughts on promoting understanding and acceptance of science at the organizational level? And so we take the organizations like companies, the military, the police, often engage in practices because that's the way we've always done it. And is there a way to get more effective evidence-based practices that have been developed through research into an organization? And specifically, you know, dealing with an organization as opposed to an individual. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up because um, we're actually seeing that organizations are more receptive. An example would be with climate change and looking at um, uh, both public and private entities. An example would be city planners for public entities and insurance companies for private entities, both public, both of those groups have been much more interested in understanding the science of climate change um, because they have a vested interest, but in this case, um, the vested interests are not only uh, better business for the insurance people, but um, better city planning, um, looking forward to moving people away from rising sea levels, for example, relocation, uh, shoring up, seawalls. So these are activities that we see um, those people who are on the front lines of climate change engaging in, and those are more organizationally driven um, acceptance of science. But you know, these, these are hard issues that someone has raised here, and I think about the human penchant for relying on anecdotal evidence and being persuaded by a good story, that sometimes that is seems so much more persuasive to us than empirical evidence. And again, these are training and habits of mind to get people to think that way. And uh, Gail and I both teach courses in educational psychology where we work with teachers. And one of the challenges there is to help teachers understand that they can rely on research on empirical evidence for what works in the classroom. And they need to do so rather than just think, I was in the teacher's lounge and this teacher said, I tried this and it works. And it's it's a hard habit to learn, and I think it's part of what a lot of us do in the courses we teach and in the training we're doing, and again, we need to help people do it earlier. Um, organizationally, that is that is difficult. I think you're raising some really important issues about how do we do this at an organizational level, and certainly teacher organizations are active in thinking about that, and I perhaps we can hold up a medical establishment as one who has always been professional in that regard, that doctors are expected to stay abreast and aware of new information, perhaps more so than teachers have been, and maybe less so than some of the organizations you name. But it's setting professional standards and expectations of where do we get our information and what do we privilege. So there are things that are going on in the scientific world that, that kind of um, slosh into the public understanding that, that then affect things. And so what, what if, if we take a look at something like the replication crisis, does that challenge our ability to convince those who are we'll, we'll broadly call anti-science about the validity of science itself? And use other examples other than replication crisis if you choose. Yes, uh, yes, absolutely. 
um, you know, scientists are people, and people make mistakes. Uh, people even um, falsify data, as we know with the original vaccination study. This is devastating to the issues of epistemic trust that Barbara was discussing. Um, so scientists aren't any better people than any of the rest of us. They make mistakes, they can be dishonest, and that's absolutely true and why we must be vigilant to not jump on one study. Um, no one ever replicated the findings of that original falsified vaccination study, and yet everyone was uh, putting more stock in it than it warranted. So we must not look at single studies, we must look at large bodies of evidence. And that's why the replication crisis has been um, so important, because it is important for us to replicate findings, because if we can't replicate them, then we really can't have the faith and trust in them that we should. We have someone that, that sent in something that they, they, they themselves identify as kind of more of a statement, and I'm, I'm going to try and craft it into a little bit of a, a sentence, uh, or into a little bit of a question. And it, and it talks about it that people were perhaps too trusting about science and, and advancement in, in the 1900s, and now we've become perhaps a pendulum swung too far the other way, perhaps. But I'm just wondering, what do you feel, where do you feel we are historically in the public understanding of science? And feel free also to talk uh, globally. I, I think we're, I'm, I'm asking specifically about the U.S., but just in general. I mean, where do we, where on the historical spectrum do you feel we stand on, in the uh, public understanding? Well, I would, I would agree with the person who asked the question about pendulum swings. Um, certainly, we may have been more trusting in the past uh, than we are today. Um, but skepticism is not inherently a bad thing. As I said, you do want to be skeptical about one-off findings. You do want to be skeptical about claims that don't seem to have validity. And then look into them and see if there's more evidence um, behind them. But also now today, you know, we have the Internet. And so every perspective is equally available. And as Barbara mentioned, if you want to know, it's a very legitimate question for someone to ask. Do dinos did dinosaurs and humans exist at the same time? If you haven't studied evolution, you may not know that answer. And so it's perfectly legitimate to Google it to try and find out. But unfortunately, what happens is the first answer that pops up is, not the scientifically accurate one. And so I do feel like the internet is something that uh, can contribute to skepticism, but it can also contribute to broader access to scientific information. But we need to learn more about how the internet works in terms of what pops up and why. And we need to teach uh, our teachers and our students how to access scientific information and to be uh, uh, skeptical about sources and um, making sure that they're getting uh, scientific information and um, not just skeptic information. Yeah, I think as Gail said, the Internet has really changed the game in, in ways that we have yet to fully comprehend or understand. And I think that has made so much information available without it being sorted or filtered or um, verified that it makes it very, very hard for individuals to know what to trust. And, um, and internationally is a really interesting issue, so I know we've looked sometimes at the evolution studies um, internationally, what is it that people believe in various countries. We do seem to be somewhat extreme in some of these beliefs, and I know uh, this is anecdotal, but I know that Gail and I were involved in a U.S.-German binational organization for a few years that worked on public understanding of science issues, and I remember the German researchers saying that they were particularly surprised at the kind of skepticism and um, denialism that they saw in the U.S. They didn't see outright denial in Germany to the same degree. Mm -hmm. And they also pointed out that they uh, often saw scientists in the media being interviewed about particular issues, and they were struck by how rarely we call upon scientists as authorities in our news media. That the um, scientist was more revered, perhaps, in Germany as someone who was an authority, an expert, someone with something to contribute and that they did not think that journalists, journalists here were more likely to draw on celebrities. You know, think about the vaccination issue and how many celebrities got interviewed about whether they were um, vaccinating their kids rather than scientists talking about the actual reasons why we should. So speaking of skepticism,
Susan, we're, we're getting a, a couple of questioners that are bringing up specific climate-related things in the IPCC and the NIPCC, and I, I don't really want to go there right now because uh, that's not really what the, the focus of this talk is. But it does raise kind of the idea, it's like the idea that science presents uh, levels of certainty versus absolute capital T truth. And I'm just wondering, how do we, how do we explain that to a um, not completely literate public? Barbara, you want to talk about uncertainty? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, uh, it's back to some of these fundamental ideas about the nature of science. Of, of, yes, some science knowledge is really durable. We're not going to repeal the um, law of gravity. That's, <laughs> that's just not going to happen. There's some things that stick with us. There are other things where we're still trying to figure it out. There's cumulative evidence. There are ways in which we learn more. Um, we have new methods, new ways of approaching it, new techniques. Um, replication studies that may lead us to think something new and helping students get excited about that to see knowledge as evolving and developing can be a, a passionate um, activity in a science class rather than thinking I'm only learning what's canned. I did a study maybe 20 years ago of comparing two chemistry classes, one that approached knowledge as objectified, reified, and known. It was you know the periodic table on the wall. We learn what's already known and a person who taught it where they were reading current issues of chemistry journals looking at what's the cutting edge of our field, what are scientists doing right now, and the number of students who got so excited from that class to go on with a science education because they could see their own role in it as well and they could see there was so much more to be known and to learn. So inciting that passion early on is important rather than just having people think this is a codified body of knowledge that you memorize and spit back out. So a lot of it has to do with how we teach science and what we convey about the nature of science. I think this will probably be our, our last question, but it, it's appropriate because even though it overlays a little bit what you just were talking about, it also brings us back to the policy implications of the paper that you wrote for the journal PIBS. And how would you approach teaching critical trust alongside critical thinking and teaching about the nature of science itself? Barbara, I'll let you I'll let you start, Barbara. I missed that. How do you teach? What, say that again. How would you approach teaching critical trust alongside critical thinking and yeah. teaching about the nature okay. of science? So again, you can go back to what about knowledge is durable? What is it that we should trust and how do we know what the substantiated body of knowledge is? But at the same time, how do we develop a healthy skepticism, the epistemic vigilance, the helping students search new topics online. You know, what do we know right now and what are the conflicting points of view here and how do we learn how to substantiate what might be trustworthy here and what's not? How do we look at sources of information and decide what might be valid? Is there a point of view? I did an exercise with some of my students last week where I had them do research on the GMO issue. If they had to make a decision to eat GMOs, because Vermont has passed this law, as most people know, um, what, what would they do? Uh, go online and see what you can learn. And it was fascinating what their heuristics were for who they trusted, what they trusted, and why. I put myself through the same exercise just to see what it would be like, and I found myself in every case going to the about box for the organization. What do we know about this organization? Who funds it? None of the students, and these are great, Middlebury, well-educated students, had thought to look at that. You know, who is it that's espousing this point of view? They were fascinated that often that information is not hidden at all. It's quite available, and then you can pursue further, well, what is this group? So I think there are ways to teach this. Um, the, the whole idea of epistemic trust and critical thinking are just critically important issues to teach early on, and as I've learned, throughout college as well. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Sinatra and Hofer. Um, I'd like to, I would like to talk a little bit about um, the, federa the, the journal PIBS. The Federation of Associations in Behavioral and Brain Sciences, or FABS, with SAGE, publishes the journal Policy Insights from the Behavioral and Brain Sciences. Uh, this journal features research findings in the sciences of mind, brain, and behavior that are applicable to nearly every area of public policy. For example, um, we'd like to recall Dr. Sinatra uh, and Hofer's article, Public Understanding of Science, Policy, and Educational Implications, in the latest edition of the journal, a perfect example of the type of work that, that, PIBS, is, that PIBS and FADS are doing.
And that's really about all we have time for today. Um, there's yet a couple more questions that have come in that, are, that I wish we had time for. Another one that brought up the chocolate, but not today, but perhaps we'll be able to answer some of those in a, a follow-up blog posting. I want to thank everyone for joining us, and a special thank you to our speakers. And in the, in the coming weeks, our registered users, please be on the lookout for an email that includes a link to view the entire webinar, the archived recording of the webinar, and slides, as well as answers to some of the questions we didn't have time for. And please stay connected with us on our blog, Sage Connection, and also at Social Science Space, for information about upcoming webinars. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you.